So today I'd just like to um, give you an introduction and an example of some inventory projects that my collaborators and I have been working on in the Philippines. Um, and I'll show you images from various sites. Um, and, but but uh, all the things that I'll talk about and all the sort of the methods and the ideas are things that can be applied anywhere in the world for sure. Um, and I'll just talk about one project in particular where, um, where we were invited to a site in the northern Philippines by a, um, a non-government organization that was invested in trying to help establish a new national park. And so th it was an area that had been, um, that had been sort of off limits to biologists and certainly foreign biologists and had a very strong ancestral tribal domain that, um, that had, had previously pretty much wanted to keep outsiders outside of their ancestral tribal area. But in this particular instance, they became very interested in having a complete inventory of the biodiversity of amphibians and reptiles and mammals and birds and insects and the parasites of the vertebrates. And so they wanted a complete inventory and they wanted this information as quickly as possible because they were going to uh, start the legal process of establishing an ancestral tribal domain a, and uh, establishing it eventually as a new national park, or that was the plan. So, um, so we started in this area, and this is just a view, and just like probably many areas around here, you can see the matrix uh, within which a new an ancestral park or a natural area is, always, is often embedded. There is, a, in the background, a, um, a forested peak that's an, a dormant volcano, and it's surrounded by um, a lot of heavily disturbed habitat, and you can see agricultural um, areas and, um, and uh, plots all the way up to the edge of the forest, and people living in particular areas, and some clear cuts, and some, um, lots of activities of different types of land use. But in general, the edge of the forest starts right about here, and, um, and that's the, right at the edge of the area that's been demarcated as the new park boundaries. And so they had a very discrete area and they wanted to know everything they could about their biodiversity. So the goal with this one was, was not a, a sampling exercise or um, an infinite um, sort of biodiversity problem that, that we required to, uh, strategic sampling to try to understand or estimate. This was an effort to literally try to record every species of amphibian, reptile, bird, mammal, and insects, and the parasites of all those things that we could to, to arrive at a complete list. And so we were gonna go all the way towards the other end of the spectrum that Town spoke about earlier, um, away from the, a lot of the sort of standardized sampling procedures all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which was unleash every tool that we could possibly have, bring as many people who are interested in collaborating with this, use every technique that we could to detect every single species present. And that was literally the mission to try to record every species and stay as long as it took till we really had convinced ourselves that, um, that we knew as much as we could about the diversity of this area. Okay, so. Uh, so here's the area. This is northern Philippines here, Ilocos province, up in the northern end of the Philippines. And this is an area that just hasn't been really well studied by biologists and has um, um, a tribal group there that uh, we're very proud of in the Philippines. This is a group that resisted the Spanish colonization effort and retained their, their ancestral tribal identity for hundreds of years beyond that period which, or for the more than the, the 300 years that the Spanish were, more than 300 years in the Philippines. And this is an area that main, remained very wild and very off limits to outsiders. But um, these areas in the northern end of this mountain range, the Cordillera, had been studied little bits by people basically who had been working along the coast. And so there were a few records of areas that had been like a couple species of amphibians and reptiles from a couple areas along the coast. But within the, the inner forested areas, there was very little known about the biodiversity in this area. Um, certainly at high elevation. Okay, let's go to the next picture. So um, like many of these surveys, this one starts with all of us in uh, leaving University of Kansas at 4 a.m. in the morning. There's snow on top of our van, so it's the middle of winter and really cold, and we get to the airport and take off our heavy winter clothes and leave them in the car and, uh, and get ready for our departure for the Philippines. And uh, 30 hours later, arriving in Manila, um, and there's the same trunks that we'll be, you'll see in the field site later the next week. But um, unpacking everything and rearranging all of our gear in our, in our um, hotel room for a night or two in Manila. And this is the same time where we run around and find chemicals and find all the supplies that we might need in the city and uh, do logistical uh, organizing and, and set up our permits with the central government. And, and then we might, uh, we have a couple different ways of getting to a place that's far from the capital city. 
some of the people may fly to a close, a nearby city, and so some people may go ahead and get the start standing up the field site, like we're going to be doing here later on. And then, um, and then a, a subset of us drive from Manila in a truck with all of our gear, and this was a 16-hour drive to get up to the north, and uh, involves packing everything in downtown Manila and getting everything up um, to the farther north. Go ahead. And then unpacking in the provincial offices where this, we were very lucky in this case to be hosted by the local Department of Environment and Natural Resources office because we were going to be training a number of their staff as part of this um, inventory effort and training them in both standardized methods for sampling because we were doing a little of that on the side for comparative purposes but also in all the inventory techniques that we had and all the methods that we could for detecting every species that we possibly could. So um, we had a central base in the provinces to work out of. And this involved, uh, luckily they had multiple vehicles, so we did ferrying all of our gear up to the edge of the forest. And in this case, we had some international participants. And, uh, and so at the, the nearby airport picked up um, participants, some uh, student from Indonesia in one case, um, and people came from all over. It was a big collaborative effort. And, um, and then we get up to the point where we're on the edge of the forest and we need to shuttle everybody through the rivers and all the sort of that the agricultural areas and farmlands that surround the edge of the forest. And for this, having your own, um, having your own four-wheel drive vehicle is really key, or having access to a four-wheel drive vehicle, uh, both in terms of being able to get people in and out very quickly, but also all the resupplies uh, that you're going to need, that we're going to need for having 20 people in the camp. Every couple days, someone has to go back and get food for a big, huge operation of a large number of people. Being able to resupply as needs come up was very important. And, uh, and so areas like this, even in the rainy season, the river comes up and uh, it was, it's critically important. And I have a little video here if you go to the next slide and click on it, scroll. There you go, just hit the, there you go. We had a lot of fun four-wheel drive, four-wheeling in this area. It was a blast. <laughs> okay, good. So, um, so here's some people that some of you know. This is Luke Welton who was here last summer for um, uh, last year for some sampling here uh, but this is a period in the Philippines earlier on in his career um, Luke was here with with Katie Allen doing some work right some last uh, la basically a year ago from now um, but we pile all the people up in this truck and ferry people up to the edge of the forest and then we get there there's usually marketing at the last um, the last the last available food source for fruit and vegetables and this is a great um, it's called a Hubble Hubble this is a transportation um, method in the Philippines where you can get up to six people and all their stuff on one motorcycle and it's just uh, it's, it's called Hubble Hubble yeah coordinating with the military for security purposes is always really important and in this case um, we just wanted to make sure that everybody in the area knows that we're there and if anyone has any questions or wants to visit with us or has any concerns about our presence that they can come in and come talk to us and of course doing coordinating with the military and all local government officials is a big part of that that process and then when we get close to the village, the last, the last sort of jumping off point, we have a lot of fun with uh, the, the children in the village who often know a lot about the animals in their area. And so some of the first things we do is show photographs of the species that we're interested in to a lot of these local kids who know exactly where to find them and know where these rare species of amphibians and reptiles are. Um, and so we have a lot of interaction with children and it's a real two-way interaction. They have a lot to teach us. And this is a former graduate student who became uh, super popular with this group of kids and uh, she'd have a, a brilliant career in teaching uh, if she wanted to go into this level of education, but go ahead. So here we are um, leaving the last jump off point, so the last town, and hiking up into the, close to the forest along the farmland, looking back at the last village. Um, and you can see forested areas off in the, back, in the background here as well. But usually this, this is the part of the climb that's the hardest part on me because it's three or four hours through, um, you know, there's no forest cover, open sun, super hot, and we may have um, 30 or 40 porters helping us with all the gear and all the equipment to get up the hill, but um, just climbing in, in blazing sunlight is rough on me at least. I sort of drink about a gallon of water a day. Another great way to access these areas if you have them available is, is, is rivers, because you can always find trails and, or walk along the edges of rivers um, to the last sites going towards that forested area. Um, so those are great for access. And then, um, but for the last hike, usually packing up everything into 20 kilos per bag of a rice sack and then bringing as many people who want to earn, earn a little bit extra um, income who can help us carry stuff up into the forest. And what we found is that 
having a rice sack with some kind of rope making it into a backpack is the way to go. And uh, there's lots of different variations on this theme, but keeping everything to about 20 kilos per person is a great way to go. And here's another crew of people just before we head into the forest. Um, and in this case, we had a bunch of security guards in that site. Um, but uh, often these folks who live near the forest and do a lot of hunting have their own means of carrying things, and so those are really helpful in some of these instances. So go ahead. So we're just heading up into the forest now in this site, and, um, and there's some of our trunks and back action backpackers that go across. Um, and this is one where we took the river up into a forested site. And then as the farther you get, if especially in the rainy season, it can get really super muddy. And so people are changing their, their footwear and changing their clothes if they're getting into more and more dense forest as we go. And then uh, as we got closer up to the site, this is right on the edge of that forested site. Um, and you can see this is an area where, where illegal loggers are dragging um, timber out of the forest. And those often make fairly decent access paths for us to enter an area where hunters are going in or, or illegal loggers even. So I, I hate to see this because it's evidence of someone dragging logs out of the forest, but, um, but often we end up hiking along those trails. And then finally getting up into camp, this is where we sort of set things up. We really like these A-frame constructions for, um, for campsites. And this is an area with lots of bamboo. It's fast growing. We don't feel bad cutting it down and using those for, um, as, as construction materials for making tables for work areas. Um, but basically when we do this, we sort of think about a working space um, and these are a bunch of tables where we can all sit down comfortably and, and prepare specimens and take notes and do the photography that we want to do. A living space, sort of away from that, so that some people, like the bird people, can be up early in the morning um, and the hurt people can be up late at night processing specimens or coming back at 2 a.m. in the morning and they won't disturb the other people who are already in camp going asleep. And then a kitchen area. Uh, those are sort of the three main areas in camps that we set up. And then once we have it constructed, we cover everything with tarp. Um, because it's often going to rain heavily in the areas that we're working or we go there at the beginning of the rainy season because that's when the frogs are starting their reproductive effort and so we want to catch that, the vocalizations of those. Um, and so this is a work area you know, being covered up. And then the living area is, is a little different. In this area, uh, terrestrial leeches were a big problem. So one of the first things we did was burn the ground cover a little bit and, and burn, put fires all around the sleeping area to smoke out a lot of the insects and a lot of the uh, terrestrial leeches that would attack you in that area. So getting rid of the leeches was an effort in this site. Go ahead. So we're covering up those areas. And then these are just like bunk houses, sleeping areas where 10 or 15 people can all sleep. In the Philippines, uh, the folks who live in around the, the forest have these great means of making a cot out of two poles and, and, and slinging between them rice sacks. And these are actually really comfortable cots. And a lot of people just with a machete so they can cut down a few saplings and having some rice sacks can make a very comfortable place to live for a couple weeks. And then here's our kitchen area with lots of uh, preparation for food and places to sit and air comfortable areas. Go ahead. And there's a real a well set up camp. This is a working area, um, a former KU student, but just separate areas for us to store our equipment and well organized areas for, um, for tables for everyone to sit around and work. And I know it sounds like a lot of the ornithologists bring the tables with them or bring chairs with them, but if you have a source of renewable forest resources or fast growing timber or bamboo or something like that, um, you can also construct your own work, work and living space fairly easily with just a knowledge of some fundamental um, construction. So here's a, and a standard kitchen. Um, we like to have like really good food so everybody's happy because a well-fed person is usually a lot happier. Uh, and lots of snacks and coffee and things like that so people can take a lot of breaks because it's going to be a long work day. And so having quality food and snacks is really important. And one of the things that we do in the Philippines is we have everybody contribute in some way to um, most parts of the process. So I, I like to say that I, won't, I don't want to ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So this is my, co, um, my collaborator um, and my, my colleague who helped organize all these expeditions, Arvin Diesmos, who's a herpetologist at the National Museum of the Philippines. And so for a couple nights, we took turns making dinner for everybody. Um, and we just sort of try to share in all the different work process so that everybody knows what everyone else is going through. Um, and in areas even where water is really, um, is, I mean, for, for a big group of 20 people or so, you need to have lots of water for drinking water, for washing dishes, for washing your clothes, for, taking, for bathing every day if you're working hard. And so we can um, take, make these, these pipe systems, which are just bamboo or, or any kind of 
any kind of pipe and connect together a bunch of little streams. So even in areas where there's not a lot of water, you can support a decent sized camp if you think strategically about where you put the camp and how you channel the water sources so that you can do the fundamentals here. Living spaces are obviously really important and so we do tents and people often in the Philippines at least in areas where it's really raining like to put tarp over the top so even if it's even if you have a nice tent you have an extra layer of protection from strong winds and rain and stuff falling branches falling in the forest can also be an issue but we learned early on that if you don't have comfortable tents you can also really make yourself a really nice shelter just by finding the right kind of palm fronds and constructing these cots and so this is an area where we didn't have a lot of um, we didn't have enough tents to support the whole group but we, we had a good source of these palm fronds and everybody made really nice comfortable areas um, and so there's no reason why you can't do this without fancy um, name brand tents and things like that so we just like to be, um, be it's pretty comfortable these are some of my my long-term best friends and field assistants in the Philippines uh, master trapper who I, I was telling some of you earlier about who's one of the best uh, Varanus lizard biologists that I've ever met and um, uh, this is the son of one of my earliest field assistants who we've raised up and brought into doing these surveys with us. I think I first took him in the field when he was like 13 or 14 and he's 25 now and has his own kids and he is such a skilled field biologist that um, I basically won't go anywhere in the field without him anymore because he's so great. Um, okay, so let's talk about a few other things. So um, living space here, obviously we, we, spent, we sort of share the, the work in the living space a little bit and it can get pretty messy when you have a run of a, a lot of specimens and a lot of work and th the, you know this is okay but what I sort of like to do is is clean up the camp and get every pick up all the trash and things like that and get the camp ordered and clean clean again for the next day because if we have a large group of people and we are doing a lot of work being attentive to those types of details is really important if we're all going to live together in a very small space so this is a well organized camp that I really like when I see camps that are set up like this right near the river that are sort of having a minimal impact and everyone's being really aware of the trash that we generate and making sure that we burn it and we don't litter and we um, take care of uh, the environment and don't spill soap and things like that into the river. 